I don't get that. I pressed on the link. I can't. Good morning, and thank you for joining us for our new episode in the Stay Connected Facebook Live series. I'm historian Edna Friedberg. While our museum remains closed, we are committed to sharing personal stories from the Holocaust with you and how they speak to our lives today in times of turmoil and uncertainty. If you run into any technical difficulties while streaming the program, please first try refreshing your browser. If that doesn't do the trick, rest assured that immediately following the program, the entire show will be available on demand. So come back and watch it at your convenience and share it with your friends. Today would have been the 91st birthday of Anne Frank. Anne may be the most widely known name and face, but she represents tens of thousands of Jewish children who were hidden for their own safety during the war. Anne and others like her had to be constantly on guard, lest they laugh too loudly or show their faces too close to a window and expose themselves and others in hiding with them. Anne died at age 15 in the Bergen-Belsen concentration camp just weeks before she would have been liberated. She and her sister Margot symbolized the lost promise of up to 1.5 million Jewish children who were murdered in the course of the Holocaust. Today, we are joined by a very special guest um, who was himself a hidden child during the Holocaust, Dr. Alfred Munzer. Hi, Al. Hi, good morning, Hitha. Good morning, so I'm, so glad, I'm so glad to see your face. Um, Al is a retired physician and former president of the American Lung Association, and he also is a cherished volunteer at our museum. Today, we'll, uh, today Al will share with us his experience as a hidden child uh, during the Holocaust, a very young child, and also pay tribute to the people who risk their own lives in order to protect him. During the course of today's program, please post your questions for Al in the comments section, and we'll get to as many of them as we can in the time that we have. So Al, as I mentioned, um, and as you know too well, um, Anne Frank's story is very, very well known and serves as an introduction of sorts to, to many people to the history of the Holocaust. And you were actually hidden as a child in the same country in the Netherlands. How is the popularity of Anne's story um, useful or, or helpful and how do you frame it when talking about your life? Well, Anne Frank does a beautiful job of telling so eloquently the story of her family. But what people have to remember is that it's only one story out of a million. Her story and my story would have to be multiplied a million times over to get a feel of what the Holocaust was really all about. So that's very helpful to the way you frame it is to know you're not um, using a million in a sort of abstract or um, emphatic way, but in fact, quite literally talking about a million or more children, yeah. each of them with their own story. A million families. Right? Um, would like to acknowledge that already just a couple of minutes into the program, we have viewers watching from all over the United States and all over the world. Uh, thank you for joining us from Raleigh, North Carolina, Florida, Ohio, Midland, Michigan, Pompano Beach, Centerville, Virginia. Good morning to you in Louisiana, in Illinois, in Wisconsin, Fort Ticonderoga, Ticonderoga, New York, and internationally from the Netherlands, your uh, native land, Al, from Brazil, the Philippines, Sweden, London in the UK, and Costa Rica. We are so glad to have you all here. Now, Al, um, let's begin at the beginning. Uh, the year before you were born, Germany invaded the Netherlands. What were conditions like during the occupation for your family and for other Jews? Well, I'll begin by telling you a little bit about my parents. They were born in Eastern Europe uh, and they left their homes in Poland uh, to go to the Netherlands and to start uh, a new life uh, away from the anti-Semitism that was so pervasive uh, in their native country. My father started a men's clothing business uh, and uh, prior to the occupation, uh, they had two children. My sister Eva was born in 1936 and my sister Leah was born in 1938, just about the same time uh, that, uh, the, that the, of Kristallnacht, the night of broken glass, when the full fury of anti-Semitism was 
unleashed uh, in, in Germany, just a few hundred miles uh, away. Uh, and then things remained fairly good in Holland for a short while. And then in May 1940, uh, Holland was invaded uh, by the Germans. Uh, and life almost changed immediately uh, for my parents and everyone else. All of the restrictions, all of the humiliations that had been placed on Jews in Poland and in Germany over several years were instituted in a very short period of time. They had to register all their property. Jewish men had to take a new middle name, Israel. Jewish women, a new middle name, Sarah. Uh, they were prohibited from using public transportation or from going into public uh, parks. Uh, but in spite of that, my parents tried to go on with their normal lives. Uh, and then in early 1941, my mother found out that she was pregnant again. Uh, and she consulted her obstetrician. And he told her in no uncertain terms that it would be immoral to bring another Jewish life into the world. And he advised her very strongly to have an abortion. Now, my mother wasn't particularly religious at the time, but she consulted the Bible and she read the story of a woman called Hannah. Hannah, you might remember, was a woman who was desperate to have a child that would go to the temple every year and pray that she might conceive. And it was in reading Hannah's story that my mother decided she could not possibly have an abortion. And so nine months later, November 23rd, 1941, I was born at home with the help of a nurse. And you know, I've talked about this with you. I love this picture a little bit too much. I think you were so sweet. So thank you for letting us share it. Um, the fact that you were born not only a Jewish baby in this precarious time, but a male child, a boy, immediately presented your parents with a dilemma. Tell us about that, please. Well, traditionally, our Jewish male children are circumcised, uh, and it's, it's a tradition that goes back all the way to biblical times, and they're circumcised at, when they're eight days old. And my parents' friends said, don't have him circumcised. It will identify him as being Jewish. But this time, the answer to my parents' dilemma came in the form of a worried look on the face of a pediatrician. And my father asked him, is there anything wrong with the baby? And then the pediatrician smiled and said, no, it's just that your little baby boy needs a minor operation, which we call a circumcision. And so my father told the, uh, the pediatrician of our Jewish tradition and indeed, eight days later, the entire family and our friends gathered in our home to observe, to celebrate uh, this first milestone uh, in a Jewish life. And um, we have a photograph here that shows that event, but it's more than just capturing this extraordinary moment. Um, tell us a bit about the significance of this image, please. Well, this photograph is really amazing. Uh, it shows my sisters at the far end of the table, my father uh, hovering just uh, above them, and then some other faces that I recognize. Uh, but what makes this photo and, and a second one that actually shows me, uh, as are very, that makes them very special, is that they're very small. They're only about one by one and a half inch in size and my mother was to keep these two small photographs hidden on her body through her subsequent stay in 12 concentration camps. She developed this feeling, this superstition, that if she ever lost these photographs, it would mean that I had been killed. Fortunately, my mother survived, the photographs survived, and I survived. And these photographs, of course, are so valuable that I have now and trusted them to the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum. And thank you for that. Um, we consider it really a, a, a sacred duty to take care of something so, so precious and to know not only did it represent um, the last shred of, of hope or continuity for your mother, but also to think what it meant more broadly for Dutch Jews. Uh, I can't really imagine that there would have been another Jewish baby boy circumcised and named 
any later than yours, um, than your ceremony. So um, really profound personally and broadly. Uh, viewers, I'd like to remind you to please post your questions for Al in the comment section so that he can engage with you uh, live here in real time. Al, uh, not long after this, your parents had to make a, a wrenching decision in order to protect you and your sisters. Um, what was that? Well, when I was about eight months old, um, Jewish men were beginning to get notices to report for labor duty. And they knew that that meant being sent to a concentration camp. First, a concentration camp in Holland, but then with a very good chance of being further, sent further east to concentration camps, for example, in Poland. And so this was a signal to Jewish families to go into hiding. Now, some families, like the family of Anne Frank, went into hiding uh, as a family unit. Uh, they hid, of course, in the famous attic uh, in Amsterdam. Uh, in the case of my family, uh, they decided that as a form of insurance, just in case one member of the family was taken, the others at least would have a chance to survive, we would separate, we would be hidden in different places. The first person to go into hiding uh, was my father. He pretended to commit an act of suicide and that gained him admission to a psychiatric hospital. The next ones to be placed were my sisters. They were placed with uh, in the two women who were neighbors of us, the Van Leeuwen sisters, uh, both of them very devout Catholic women. Uh, and my two sisters then at that point assumed a Catholic identity. Uh, their attempt at trying to hide, perhaps openly in, her, in their case, uh, while from, uh, being per, uh, from being found out uh, by the Nazis. That left my mother alone with me in the house. Probably the most frightening time in her life, she told me. Finally, uh, a woman across the street and another neighbor, another friend, Annie Madna, agreed to take me in. And I was placed with Annie Madna. And at that point, my mother closed our home on Zoutmannstraat for the very last time. And she joined my father in the same psychiatric hospital where he was a pretend patient, in her case, working as a nurse's assistant. And I want to be sure that our, our viewers understand that agreeing to take in Jewish children. It wasn't just the, the burden and the incessant work of taking care of a, of a baby or a child, but that it was also illegal and very dangerous, but that the stakes were particularly high for Jewish children because although Nazi Germany intended to kill every Jewish person, regardless of age, um, children were especially vulnerable. Uh, just to cite a statistic as an example, uh, by the end of the war, two out of three adult men or women Jewish men or women um, would be dead in Europe, but 90% of Jewish children died during the course of the war. And the causes of this are many. Um, one of the main reasons is that they were not considered useful or exploitable as slave labor. Um, and so along with the elderly and pregnant women, they were often among the first to be sent to the gas. Um, Al, we have a viewer named Brad from Iowa who wants to know how did your family, how did your parents find people who are willing to hide you and your sisters? This was really quite a task, actually. People were not, you know, did not offer their services readily. Uh, but uh, Annie Madna, for example, had been a very close friend. Uh, her children, the three, the Madna children, uh, regularly came to our home. Um, Davy Madna, for example, was a, a playmate of my sisters. And so there was a very close relationship but they took a very, very high risk. She took a very, very high risk uh, in agreeing to take me in. Uh, and Jewish male children, because they were circumcised, were even more difficult uh, to place. You mentioned um, the Van Leuven sisters, if I got their name right, who took um, your sisters. Um, what were some of their motivations? Well, in there, first of all, they were very close neighbors. Uh, they were both teachers. Uh, they had been teaching my two sisters, actually, uh, and they were very, very devout Catholic. Uh, and one of them even 
relates having a dream in which the Virgin tells her to take Jewish children into hiding. Uh, and so my parents knew them very well, trusted them, and decided to entrust my sisters to them. And when people think of hiding, they may take the word quite literally or because of Anne Frank and similar stories, think of physical hiding like uh, the Frank family did in their secret annex in the attic. But your sisters were actually hiding out in the open under assumed identities. Tell us a bit about their experience, please. Well, the, in, as part of their Catholic identity, they attended a Catholic school uh, and participated in Catholic um, ceremonies, processions. Uh, and so that was really uh, a way of hiding uh, their Jewish identity. Uh, later on, uh, they were actually taken uh, to visit uh, my parents at the hospital where they were both, hi both hiding. Uh, and apparently that's where the discussion was made as to whether my sisters could be baptized. Uh, I surmise, I, I assume that my parents gave permission because indeed several weeks later, after that visit, which was on Christmas day, 1943, 42, sorry, uh, my, my parent, my two sisters were baptized on January 18th, 1943. And all of these steps, the baptism, in fact, they were given new names, if I remember correctly, um, were taken in the hope that by portraying them as young Catholic girls, they would be sheltered or their Jewishness could be disguised. Uh, for people who are interested in learning more about hidden children, the different measures or creative ways that people who cared for them tried to shelter them or protect them, I um, encourage you to go. We're posting in the comments section a link to our online special exhibition called Life in Shadows about hidden children in the Holocaust, where you can read about um, children like Al and his sisters, Leah and Eva, and um, the ways that they were um, protected. We have an extraordinary number of international visitors today, so I do want to acknowledge those. Thank you so much for joining us from Athens, Greece, from Canada, Israel, South Africa, Australia, from Copenhagen and Denmark. Uh, we have people joining us and watching from Mexico, from Milan, Italy, Istanbul, and Turkey, from Poland, Albania, India, Peru, El Salvador, Nicaragua, and Germany. Wow, um, we are so glad you are here. And I know Al is an intrepid traveler and has visited many of those places, in fact. Um, Al, you were only nine months old when you were placed in hiding, as you mentioned, with a, a neighbor and friend. Who were the people who bravely took you in? About that family was just an amazing family. Uh, first of all, uh, and, you know, I remained with, with Annie Madla for about a month or so. Uh, she had had uh, some bad run-ins with the Nazis. And so she passed me on to her sister. Her sister's name was Irina Polak. Turned out that Irina Polak had a neighbor who was a member of the Dutch Nazi party. And so she was afraid that he might hear a baby crying, a strange baby crying. So eventually I was placed with Annie Madna's ex-husband, uh, Tole Madna. Tole Madna uh, was born in Indonesia. Indonesia uh, was uh, a Dutch colony, and he had come to the Netherlands together with his mother uh, in the early 1900s. His mother went back to Indonesia, but he remained and began a career uh, managing uh, Indonesian restaurants. Uh, he and Annie Matna had three children before they were uh, divorced. Uh, and I ended up after being with, with I ended up with, with Papa Matna, with Tole Matna, uh, and the three children of whom he had uh, joint custody uh, with Annie Matna. Uh, and I really was part, became part and parcel of their family. They also had a nanny. Uh, who had taken care of the three Madna children. Uh, she was a, a woman born in Indonesia and really a very special woman. It is this woman, this nanny, who really now became my mother. She was completely illiterate, could not read or write, did not speak the Dutch language, only the Indonesian language. 
and knew nothing of politics, but she had a heart of gold and knew to do what is right. This woman would walk miles every day just to get milk for me. I was in the house illegally, so there were no ration coupons and the family had to split their meager rations with me to feed me. You know, a few years ago, I was in Holland uh, and a woman stopped me and said, you know, you used to drink my milk. And I asked, what do you mean by that? And she said, well, all children in Holland were given a small bottle of milk while they were in school. And my mother told me to save half that little bottle for the baby next door. And you were the baby next door. So a little eight-year-old kid already participating in saving a human life. But all the memories that I have of the Madna family, as you saw in this photograph, are happy ones. Uh, I, had, I was surrounded uh, by uh, a loving father, if you will, Papa Madna, Devi Madna, Billy Madna, and even a little dog. I was given a new name, and that was Bobby. And to this day, I'm always called Bobby by members of the Madna family. I slept in Mima's bed, and I'm told that she kept a knife under her pillow, vowing to kill any Nazi who might try to come and get me. That's how protective she was of me. Hearing that anecdote and the lengths to which Mima Saina went um, to feed you, to keep you safe, um, seeing that photo of her holding you, I'm struck by the uh, the vagaries of human life and the uncertain twists and turns that um, an uneducated Muslim woman from Indonesia ends up being the, the caregiver and protector of a little white Jewish boy in the Netherlands. It's um, truth is stranger than fiction, but love is bigger than any of those, those forces. Um, you, you're, you were physically hidden, unlike your sisters who hid in plain sight. And a woman named Regina is asking, how do you keep a small child quiet and entertained in hiding? Um, what was your daily life like for these years? Well, for the most part, you know, I tried to, the family tried to give me as normal a life as possible. There were certain restrictions. I wasn't allowed to come near a window for fear that strangers uh, might see a very different looking child uh, in the home. Uh, my only view of the outside world was what I could see uh, through a, a mail slump. And then periodically, I would be told to go hide in a closet. And that's probably when the house was being searched. But what I remember about it, I thought it was a game. Uh, and I would play with the Christmas decorations that the family had hidden there. So fortunately, they really shielded me uh, from, from anything bad. And, you know, probably, the most telling memory that I have of Mima Saina uh, is a beautiful, beautiful lullaby that she used to sing. Uh, and I was reminded of that lullaby a few years ago when a group of Indonesian students visited the Holocaust Museum and began to sing it. Must have been a very um, visceral, almost unconscious kind of reaction to hear that. Yes, very much so. Viewers, please do send your questions for Al. Um, I know he'd be glad to answer them. Um, so Al, while you were so lucky and uh, so dependent on these very loving and kind people who took the risk to take you in, uh, the rest of your family remained in profound danger. Tell us briefly, if you can, about um, what happened to your sisters and to your mother and father. Well, my sisters uh, were actually uh, remained with the Van Deuren sisters uh, for about a year. Uh, and uh, uh, then it was, uh, they felt that it was no longer safe for them to be there. And so their priest, uh, their pastor, Father Lutters, found a new home with them, with a woman called Rosa Mazurowski. Uh, and uh, my sister were entrusted to Rosa uh, sometime in, in September uh, 1943. Uh, they remained with Rosa until January 1944. And at that point, Rosa's husband, a man by the name of J.J. Schermer, denounced his wife and my sisters uh, to the Nazis. His wife went to prison, uh, eventually to, to concentration camps, uh, including Ravensbrück, uh, but did survive. 
My sisters, however, were taken immediately to Auschwitz on a transport that included several hundred children and were killed in Auschwitz. I'm struck um, when hearing this story, not only by the, the pointless tragedy of your sisters being killed, but that it's a reminder that not all actions or choices in the course of the Holocaust were driven by ideology. In this case, your, your sisters were um, denounced and exposed because of a, a marital fight, a fight between a husband and wife, a very mundane reason. And we know that there were many rescuers uh, who took care of people in hiding, of Jews in hiding, because they were paid. Um, they needed money, they needed to feed their families. Um, so very relatable reasons. Um, what did Tole Madna say about why he took the risk to, to shelter you in his home? Well, people ask Tole Madna why he took the risk uh, to hide a Jewish child and risk his family. And his answer was a very simple one. It was, what else was I to do? To him, there simply was no choice. It was the only thing that he could do. And I really think it stands as an example to all of us. You know, we are faced with choices uh, just like him. And he made a choice that obviously was very, very difficult, a high risk choice, but he did what was right. We've heard about um the tragic deaths of your sisters, uh, the criminal deaths of your sisters. What about your mother and your father? Well, my, both my parents remained in that psychiatric hospital for a very short period of time. And then they were both deported together with many other patients from that hospital. They went first to two concentration camps in Holland, Westerbork and then Fucht, where they both did slave labor for the Philips Electronics factory. After about eight months there uh, in 1944, my father in March, my mother in June, they were taken to Auschwitz. My father remained in Auschwitz uh, for uh, several months uh, and then uh, went on to Mauthausen and three more camps in Austria. Finally, a place high up in the Austrian Alps, one of the most beautiful places in the world where there was a terrible concentration camp called Ebensee, where the Inmates, including my father, assembled V2 rockets in underground abandoned salt mines. Terrible work with almost no food, never seen sunlight. And fortunately, my father did survive long enough to be liberated by the US Army. But he was so ill, so sick, uh, that he perished two months later. And he's buried in the Ebensee concentration camp, with his, which is now just one huge cemetery. So I never really knew my father. And, you know, I, he's only been brought to life by the stories my mother told me. And then by certain tokens like this pen of my father, uh, which my mother encouraged me to take with me whenever I had uh, a difficult exam, either in college uh, or uh, in medical school, a token of my father standing uh, by me. Uh, my mother uh, was taken from Auschwitz to another camp called Reichenbach. She continued to do work in electronics for the Telefunken factory. Uh, when that factory was bombed by the Allies, she was placed on a whole series of death marches and finally liberated uh, at the uh, Danish border through the intervention of Volk Bernadotte, went to Sweden to recuperate, and then eventually in late July uh, 1945, was sent back to Holland. And that is when I was reunited with my mother. And that's the very first clear memory of the entire period that I have, a very clear memory. I have been asleep in one of the back rooms of the house and my foster sister, Devi Madna, came to get me, carried me into the living room where the entire family was sitting in a circle. And they did what you do with a crying, cranky child. You pass it from one lap to the next. And what I remember was that there was one lap I refused to sit in. A woman I kept pushing away. And that was my own mother because she was a complete stranger to me. My mother at that point was Lima Saina. I'm struck no matter how many times I hear you talk about your mother and her experience. 
it's still inconceivable to me everything that she endured in a dozen concentration camps that she endured personally, but also during that period, having no way of getting any information about her three young children, whether you were alive or dead, whether you were well, and for her to come back to the Netherlands, hoping to find her family and to find only you and you who didn't even know her. Um, how did your mother go about reintegrating herself into your life and getting to know you? Well, initially, uh, the plan was uh, for Mima to continue to care for me. Uh, my mother felt, you know, that that was the safest way for me to, to gradually get to know her. Uh, and that, that occurred for about uh, uh, two months. But then sadly, uh, in October 1945, my mother passed away. Not this your is mother. A photo Yes. Not your, not your mother. Sorry, Mima. Mima, your, Mima your, your foster mother. Yeah. My foster mother. Mima sadly uh, passed away. Uh, she suffered a cerebral hemorrhage. And so that really sort of forced me, of course, to bond to my mother. Uh, this is a remarkable photograph that I received very recently uh, from a little boy, uh, Arthur Friedowitzi. He was six years old at the time, and then he recently contacted me and sent me this photograph. He's now 81 and it's his father who took uh, this photograph. And it's the first photograph of, I have of me and my mother taken perhaps days after we were united. And there I am on uh, the little tricycle, uh, Arthur's sister Helga, whose name I never knew me previously either, standing behind me uh, and there is my mother standing behind the two of us. Uh, the first picture of my mother. And, you know, it's amazing. It's, it's Helga who's holding on to me, not my mother, because I think at that point, I was just beginning to bond to my mother. And it's really just astonishing and, and lucky um, that you continue to be able to add more pieces to the puzzle of your, your life. Um, to receive a photo like this just weeks ago, right? Um, it's really, it's weeks ago. And it's, it's really truly amazing. It's 75 years after the end of the Holocaust, stories are still coming out. Uh, and it's, it's really, the word closure, you know, has, has a lot of different meanings. But to me, really at this point, it is finally finding out what really happened. It's also extremely gratifying to be contacted uh, by a little boy, now 81, who was my buddy at the time. Well, and to remember that he and his sister were probably the only children who were allowed to play with you outside of your foster family, them and the woman you said you encountered who remembered saving half her milk for you, um, reminds us of the circles of trust and of community fabric that were required um, to save the life of a little, little toddler. Al, we are almost out of time, but we have quite a few uh, viewer questions, which I would like to pose to you. Um, a woman named Lisa, who is studying brain development in early childhood asks, can you share how you were able to trust other people and be open with them uh, later in life? Well, I was very fortunate uh, that uh, I was hidden with a very, very loving family. And so really, you know, I, I could not have had a better family other than the Magna family. They treated me like one of their own. Uh, I never felt threatened, never felt bad. I was very, very fortunate that all my memories are, are good ones. And so fortunately, uh, I, I never had to face that dilemma. Uh, relatedly, a viewer named Irma wants to know if you still stay in contact with your foster family to this day. Absolutely. Uh, uh, sadly, uh, most of the original members of the family have uh, passed away. Devi Madna uh, was, a nine, was 93 and just passed away uh, this past year. And we had many conversations uh, together uh, and I stayed in touch with all of them. And now I'm in touch with the next generation and also the three other children uh, after Papa Madna uh, remarried, uh, Tole, Vani, uh, and Tipa Tipa. And I'm in touch with them all the time. Uh, we Skype, uh, we talk, we get together, go to reunions. Uh, so I am still very much a part of the Magna family. And they still call me Bobby. 
Uh, a viewer named Carmen wants to know, Al, have you forgiven those responsible for the heinous crime of the Holocaust and for the loss of more than 6 million people? It's really not for me, you know, to, to forgive people who committed these atrocious crimes. First of all, it has to begin with the person who committed those crimes. Uh, they are the ones who really have to ask for forgiveness uh, and have to have uh, contrition. Uh, and I think that goes really on an individual basis. By the same token, I do not hold people who were not directly involved responsible. Uh, my mother taught me that. Never judge people just because of their race or their national identity, including being German. There are good people, and bad people everywhere. It's really inspiring that she could maintain that perspective after all that she endured and all that she lost. Yes. Um, Al, in closing, um, I wanna share one more comment and question that has come in. Um, a viewer named Naomi comments, this is heartbreaking. Al Munzer's personal story and the pictures that you're sharing leave me feeling both speechless and inspired. And finally, a question from a high school history teacher who teaches Holocaust studies along or as part of his instruction in world history. He asks, what message would you like to tell high school students? What lessons could they learn from the Holocaust? I think the most important lesson is that even when surrounded by evil, it is still possible to do what is right. And the lessons really pertain at all levels. You know, last year I spoke at a high school in Marlton, Arkansas. Uh, and I told the students, you know, that, that hate really begins and otherism, as we call it, uh, begins with bullying. And I warned them about that. And a few years, a few months, weeks later, uh, I received thank you notes from that school. And one of them especially touched me. Uh, and this young woman said, you know, we had a real bullying problem in our school, but after people heard your story of where hate can lead, we no longer have a bullying problem. And that was incredibly gratifying. So the lessons of the Holocaust, I really think, are more important uh, than ever. Uh, as we have divisions around the world, as we see, sadly, uh, a return of anti-Semitism, a return of racism, the lessons of where hate can lead are more important than ever. Well, Al, I want to thank you so very much. It is always a privilege to hear you speak. Um, and for sharing your personal experience, but also how it has shaped your own worldview. Um, really glad that you could join us today. Thank you very much. For viewers who would like to know more detail, because we really only had the chance to skim the very, very surface of the Munzer family, um, we will be posting a full video where you can watch Al in his own words and other museum programs um, go into more depth of his story and the way that the Madna family um, saved and changed his life. We wanna thank you for watching us today and on Anne Frank's birthday, we remember not only the hidden children of the Holocaust, both those who survived and those who did not, but also pay tribute to those brave and generous souls like the Madnas who risked their lives to offer them shelter. We hope that you will join us again next week at our regular time, Wednesday, June 17th at 9.30 a.m. Eastern time in the United States when we will mark World Refugee Day by tracing the fate of the ship, the St. Louis, which had 937 Jewish refugees on it, um, seeking a place, a haven from Nazi persecution. Our guest next week will be museum historian, Dr. Dion Afumado. So hope to see you then. And again, thank you. Take care.